Today we're launching into part four of the course, The Politics of Insecurity, uh, and that's going to preoccupy us in the next two lectures. So um, let's, let's start by uh, going back uh, a few years when, before the real backlash starts in. Uh, this is um, 2011. Today is the Tea Party movement's biggest day. I mean, it's the day people are most frustrated with their government when they're sitting down and writing those checks to the IRS and thinking, you know, why am I paying all this money? Today really highlights the Tea Party's message that politicians here in Washington are just out of control. They're fed up with Washington and sick of runaway spending. And at Tea Party rallies across the country this weekend, there were plenty of Republicans fighting for their support. Let's send them this message. Don't tread on me. Real solidarity means coming together for the common good. This Tea Party is real solidarity. Some, like former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin and Minnesota Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, are Tea Party favorites. They've been very exciting, very encouraged about my potential candidacy, and I'm excited to be here with them. And not to be left out, billionaire businessman Donald Trump made his first appearance at a Tea Party rally. We have a man right now that almost certainly will go down as the worst president in the history of the United States. No one knows if Trump is serious, but some early polls have him on top for the Republican nomination. He's gotten attention with his questions about whether President Obama was born in the United States, a widely discredited issue other Republican contenders have discarded. But in playing to the Tea Party, the potential candidates also will have a challenge. Recent polls show 47 percent of Americans have an unfavorable view of the movement. So candidates looking for Tea Party votes have to be careful not to alienate moderates. That's what the White House is sure hoping, that all of these Republican presidential candidates are out there and sort of waving the flag of the Tea Party, and they believe that that will turn off independent voters. Now, this movement, of course, started just two years ago. So this will be the first presidential campaign these Tea Party voters can try to influence. And we, of course, don't know what kind of impact they will have in the fight over the Republican nomination. But some of these candidates are assuming that they're going to need these Tea Party votes to win. So that was 2011, two years after the advent of the Tea Party. People still didn't quite know what to make of it. It had been quite a successful lobbying group in Washington in uh, producing major changes in um, the Obamacare bill that had been passed uh, the previous year, but it still was very unclear what sort of electoral force it was going to be. Um, today's agenda is to really explore the economic, demographic, and cultural sources of the 2016 backlash and the larger puzzle of resurgent identity politics. Um, the political sources of these developments are going to be deferred until Thursday's lecture. And today we're really going to be thinking, in terms of my ideas, interests, and institutions, we're really going to be thinking about the tensions and complementarities between interests and, and ideas uh, in the evolution uh, in, I should say, in the origins and ev evolution of this backlash. So I want to begin by digging a little more deeply into the Tea Party ideology uh, that you saw uh, being uh, appealed to there by going back to the very start of the movement. And this is an, an anti-tax... Um, rally in uh, 2009, September of 2009. Most of those there would have called themselves patriots. That don't tread on me flag was an early symbol of the American Revolution, who argued that their government today is betraying traditional principles. Steve Butler, a physician from Indiana, was handing out copies of the Constitution. If you read the quotes of Thomas Jefferson, these guys were conservatives, and they said that the control should be with the people and not with the big government. Ileana Johnson came to America from Romania some 30 years ago. I find myself now, every morning when I wake up, what kind of freedom have we lost today? You could also find plenty of signs of something else, a rage that identifies President Obama with Hitler or Stalin, 
that questions his citizenship, that seems to celebrate the death of a famous liberal. And among the main currents of the protesters here, a conviction that the media, Fox News and talk radio accepted, are deliberately concealing the truth. Yeah, they're blocking it out. I mean, we know it. Everybody knows it. You see these people back here? They all know there's something happening, but the mainstream media, they don't tell it. It's your freedom! But perhaps what most united these protesters was a broader discontent, a sense that they are not being heard, that their interests and the nation's interests are in the hands of a few. Don Newman came up from Texas. It's all a good old boy network, you know, where they don't care what we think. You know, they're going to, everybody's in everybody's bed, you know, and everybody's pocket. And it's who's got the most money. It's all about greed and power. So there you have, um, I think, in a very tightly distilled form, the four major elements of the Tea Party outlook or ideology. One is this um, very staunch anti-elitism, the sense that uh, the political establishment and the economic establishment are uh, rec reflected in both political parties is uh, fundamentally opposed to the interests of people like themselves. Secondly, lots of conspiracy theories uh, floating around this movement, and you saw uh, some of them there, conspiracies among the media to con conceal uh, what's going on being central among them. Um, third, hostility to taxes and to government, especially to the federal government. And this sort of harkens back, I think, to the Edsel and Edsel that I talked to you about some uh, weeks ago, the connection between the anti-tax movement and um, uh, antipathy for ethnic minorities. And you see these things go together there as well with the, the racism questioning President Obama's citizenship uh, and, and so forth. So, the, and we're gonna come back to the, the, the view of the world uh, that, that these four elements constitute later in the lecture. But let's first talk about the economic sources of the backlash. And so this is a little bit of review of things I've told you before, but then some addition to it. Uh, last week, I, I pointed out that one of the sources of the anti-elitism in the backlash, backlash was the divergence that on the one hand, um, after the financial crisis, people connected to the financial sector or with significant financial assets uh, had their fortunes turn around pretty quickly, and by 2016, 2017, all the major stock markets were basically back, and much of the wealth that had evaporated or had appeared to evaporate during the financial crisis had pretty much been restored for those people. But that there was a very different impact on the real economy, and when I, I showed you these slides first about uh, unemployment, that. Uh, more people were unemployed for longer, uh, both in terms of um, short-term unemployment and longer-term unemployment, um, and, and uh, that, that this didn't show signs of ending anytime soon. Indeed, the long-term unemployment rates were the highest uh, at least since the 1950s. I talked about the impact of the housing crisis, um, the, the, the very high level of foreclosures, and then in a separate lecture, I talked about the disparate racial impact of the housing crisis. Um, so just building on some of that, uh, if you look at what happened to, to real wages in many of the advanced countries, but we're gonna focus today on the US, you can see that this is um, um, real wages changes in real wages between 2008 and 2017. And you can see it's, it's very, very modest. So real incomes in the U.S. grew by, over that period, by about uh, 6% uh, total. Uh, not, not very much at all. And if you look at the, the, the who benefited from the revival uh, of 
of the economy, even though the growth was pretty slow, we had uh, big increases in productivity growth. Uh, that's the top line over there. Uh, but if you look at hourly compensation with wages, there's two different measures of it, some technical differences that need not concern us here. You can see that the, the returns to the increases in productivity, productivity were not going to hourly wage workers. And this is part of the Piketty story that the uh, returns to capital greatly exceed the returns uh, to labor over time. So it's a period of, of wage stagnation for people earning hourly wages. Um, this decade, uh, or eight years, if you like, after the financial crisis. Um, then if we, if we zoom out a little bit further into the larger context of long-term employment insecurity, this has been building for decades. I talked in an earlier lecture about the decline of union membership, which you can see begins pretty much uh, right after World War II. That's the blue line there, declining union membership, whereas um, the share of income going to the top 1% uh, is flat through about the 1970s, but then starts to take off um, pretty dramatically. If you look at um, union membership falling and middle class incomes, they pretty much fall in tandem. Uh, so the middle class share of income, uh, as, as workers get less and less leverage, uh, also uh, has been falling for decades. Um, this is an, another show, slide I, I showed you relatively recently. This is the job insecurity of the late baby boom uh, workers, workers b b born between 1957 and 1964, um, by age 52, uh, have changed, jam uh, changed jobs 12.3 uh, times on average. Very big levels of employment insecurity. And um, the, again, zooming out even further, this is the this is the again the. The, the story that's highlighted by Piketty, his co-author Saez, and many others, that we have had this uh, very high levels of inequality that were in the Gilded Age, uh, and people by the end of World War II thought were, were going away, uh, in fact have come back, and we're now at the same level, uh, levels of inequality that um, haven't been seen for more than a century. And this is, of course, what partly motivated the Occupy Wall Street movement, which I will have more to say about in a future lecture, and the, the Bernie Sanders insurgency in the 2015-16 uh, primaries. And to give a sense of, uh, of what the Sanders campaign was all about, let's go look at him or listen to him for a minute uh, a couple of years before he decided to run for president. Today, the wealthiest 400 individuals in America own more wealth than the bottom half of America, 150 million people. 400 and 150 million. Today, and this is really quite amazing, the six heirs to the Walmart fa uh, fortune the Walmart company, of course, started by Sam Walton. His children, one family, now own more wealth than do the bottom 30% of the American people. One family owns more wealth than the bottom 30%, 90 million Americans. And I know we have some of my colleagues coming up here and say, look, not everybody in America is paying taxes. You got millions of people are not paying any taxes, no kidding. They don't have any money, because all of the money is on the top. So uh, that, was, that was the economic story and the, uh, the, the outrage that um, Sanders is articulating there. And he, and an interest-based story, one would anticipate that this would resonate with large numbers of voters. And we've seen in, in this that, that uh, the, the, the damage that has been done uh, 
uh, was not just to white voters, but to African Americans disproportionately and Hispanics during the housing crisis. And on an interest-based story, one would expect that this was an opportunity to build a coalition that would, you one would have anticipated would do something about that. But uh, life has more imagination than us. And uh, what this story missed is what I'm going to spend most of uh, today's lecture talking about, namely the demographic and cultural sources of uh, the backlash, uh, which have also been building in different ways uh, for a very long time. Um, but before we dig into that, I want to first make one point that I think is, is a, 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 a symptom of the fact that this, the, this story is perhaps a little bit too simple, um, at least as I've told it this far. And I'm referring here to um, the fact that employment insecurity is not just about working class voters. Um, this very important new book by our colleague in the law school, Dan Markovitz, called The Meritocracy Trap. Um, a, a big part of, of Markovitz's message in that book is about the, the so-called hollowing out of the middle class, that many occupations that uh, used to be middle class uh, occupations of upwardly mobile people are, are disappearing either offshore or more importantly to technology. So if you think about, we talked about uh, bankers giving mortgages a while ago. Uh, if you wanted a mortgage, the person giving you the mortgage was a local bank manager who had um, worked their way up to that position. It was, it was a stable job. Uh, you would go down and have uh, meetings with that person. They might be a neighbor of yours in, the, in a middle class community. Today, when you apply to a for a mortgage, it's to uh, Quicken Loans. Uh, you do it over the phone to somebody who probably has a high school education. Um, maybe not even uh, on the other end of the phone, might not even be in the United States. Um, they type your, your um, characteristics and economic data into a software program, an off-the-shelf software program, and um, uh, you, you get the answer as to whether or not you're eligible for a mortgage uh, in a matter of minutes. Um, the, the bank manager who would have interviewed you uh, about your mortgage has long since disappeared. Those jobs have gone away. Um, so it's not just the bank tellers, it's the bank managers. And it's creeping, and this, this uh, disappearance of employment is creeping up the occupational ladder. I, I for the last uh, seven years now, have been teaching at the Yale School of Management. Uh, seven years ago, uh, one of the most um, attractive things to do for people who were graduates of uh, business schools was to go into investment banking. Um, it's not a favored activity anymore. Why? Because a lot of that, the, those jobs are going to big data. There are algorithms now um, that make it much less uh, appealing uh, to, to go there. But then the question arises, what are these people going to do instead? Um, so we should, when we think about employment insecurity, we shouldn't just focus on the disappearance of industrial jobs that force people into low-paid service sector work. And if you want an, another data point that tends to support this, if you look at uh, prim primary voters for Donald Trump in um, 2016. I'm not talking about the general election when you, when you would expect most Republicans to vote for whoever the candidate was, but primary voters, uh, when they had many other choices, they're not, they don't fit the stereotype of Joe Lunchbucket. Um, so if you look, one third of the Trump uh, primary voters earn less than the median income. That's less than $50,000 is the median income for a family of four in the United States in 2016. Another third earns uh, between 50 and 100,000, and the third third earned more than 100,000. So two thirds, uh, by, by most definitions of working class, two thirds of Trump's primary supporters 
were not working class voters. Um, so there's obviously something much more complex going on here than, uh, than the, the stereotypical image of who the Trump voter was. And it was something that I think the, the sort of Bernie Sanders kind of analysis didn't capture uh, at all. And I think that uh, that's what we have to try and understand with some other, other tools. Now, uh, two very interesting uh, scholars, one uh, a sociologist um, by the name of um, Arlie Hochschild, uh, and another political scientist by the name of Catherine Kramer had spent the, the five years leading up to 2016 engaged in ethnographic studies of um, angry white voters. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, Hochschild in a minute. She studied and lived with oil workers in Louisiana. Uh, Kramer studied rural workers in uh, Wisconsin, which she was trying to understand um, the, the rise of Scott Walker, and, and um, Kramer's book is called The Politics of Resentment. And what was interesting about these, both these books is that they, they, the research for them, them was really done before uh, the advent of the backlash we're really uh, studying now in the years leading up to 2016, but they shed a lot of light on it. Um, so Hochschild's book, um, strangers in their own land. Uh, it's based on this five years she spent in Louisiana with oil workers who had been uh, downwardly mobile, many of whom had lost their jobs. Um, their communities had often been savaged by the environmental effects of the industry within which they were working. Uh, lakes which they had fished in as children were now so polluted that um, the fish in them were all long since dead. There were very high levels of cancer and other uh, diseases that were widely attributed to the pollution in the community. Large numbers of people had been laid off because of the mechanization of the industry. Um, and yet, the paradox that she tried to understand was what th that the, the anger of, of most of these uh, people was directed not at the oil companies, but at the government, and particularly at the federal government. And she tried to uh, understand this through participant observation. And um, so here is um, here's a summary that she gives of the central finding in, in her book. I struck upon something I call the deep story, which is a story that feels true. You take the facts out, you take the moral judgments out, and you, you have a picture, a metaphor for what goes on. In this, people are waiting in line as in a, a, a pilgrimage to the top of a hill where there is the American dream. People have been waiting in line a long time. They feel deserving, their feet are tired, the line hasn't moved in many years. And then they see uh, some people cutting in line. Who is that? That would be blacks who now have access to jobs that used to be reserved for whites. That's women now have access to jobs reserved formerly for men. Uh, immigrants and uh, refugees and now endangered animals all seem to be getting ahead of you having cut in line, then people notice Barack Obama, a representative of the federal government, seeming to wave to the line cutters. He has sponsored them. Indeed, the federal government comes to seem like an instrument of their marginalization. It has indirectly put them back. You're now at the back of the line, and uh, no one's really uh, paying attention to you, and then someone ahead of the line turns around and says, oh, you're a southern, ill-educated, Bible-thumping redneck. And then you feel estranged. There's a moment in which you feel like now a stranger in your own land. And you're kind of stuck until one day 
someone comes along, a, a magisterial figure, powerful, who sees and recognizes your, your estrangement and says, I'm going to give you your country back again. So uh, this is this narrative of cutting in. There's some notion that uh, people are getting ahead in line in front of you and therefore preventing you from advancing. And uh, if you read the whole book, um, it, is, uh, it is a story of felt humiliation and rage at this phenomenon. And so when, when you think about uh, the, the reasons for their dislike of the government, it's first that they, they perceive the government as an agent of this cutting in, as the principal agent and facilitator of this cutting in, and then if, if they need uh, help from the government because they lose their jobs, they have to go in and be interviewed and uh, uh, humiliated by people who have job security, who have government pensions, who might well not be white, uh, and so it reinforces this sense of victimization um, that feeds this narrative of cutting in and the, what, what um, Kramer calls the, the politics of resentment. Uh, and it's, I think it's important to, this was a study done in Louisiana, but Kramer's is in Wisconsin, and there have since been five or six other books. Uh, so this is not just a phenomenon about the South, and I think that's important to understand. It's really a, a much larger phenomenon. The, the story that Kramer tells is very analogous, that rural voters in Wisconsin have many of the same resentments and, and many of the same uh, causal stories that they tell themselves uh, about, the, um, about the, the sources of their failure to advance and the sources of their alienation. And one other thing in the, in the um, Hochschild comments that I just want to highlight and I'm going to come back to is that you notice when the, she described the cutting in there, she said, uh, cutting in uh, African Americans are now uh, getting jobs that were formerly reserved for whites. And uh, women are now getting jobs that were formerly reserved for men. And so this raises the, uh, the whole issue of people's implicit baselines. Um, because when, uh, when white poor whites of this kind think about something like affirmative action, they see this as, as somebody be giving, being given an unfair advantage, a leg up, but they, they cannot perceive that this is, a, this is a, a remedial response to a kind of advantage that they had in the past. Uh, so a very important book uh, on this subject by Ira Katz Nelson at the Columbia uh, Political Science Department called When Affirmative Action Was White, um, about the advantages that whites previously enjoyed that are now have been uh, eroded or taken away. And so, the, as I said, the, the question becomes, what is one's baseline? And this is, this is feeds, if you like, what, what are gonna be, I'm going to call irreconcilable narratives uh, about the, the nature of what's going on in the country because the, the people from whom um, the traditional advantages have been taken away can't see that in the sense that the fish can't see the water it's swimming in. And so the narrative that they will tell uh, is, is in, in some important sense incommensurable with the narratives that other will tell. So I'm, I'm gonna want, I want us to um, try and understand the sources of these uh, irreconcilably conflicting narratives that I think have become in many ways weaponized uh, since 2016. Um, so, and, and I think there's no way to do this except by going back into American history and seeing how contentious and tangled uh, these perceptions of who has had what advantage and when and what 
is the appropriate thing to do about it. So um, let's, let's reflect on some landmarks in the battles over race in America, and particularly the, the battles over uh, separation of the races and integration of the races that have been here uh, literally since the country's founding. Uh, I'm not going to go back all the way to the founding, but let's go back to before the Civil War. In 1857, in the Dred Scott case, um, this was a, a, a fugitive slave, had got, got an escape to a non-slave state, and had been, the question was whether they could sue in order to uh, prevent themselves from being returned. And the court held, uh, among other things, that the, the, the person had no standing to sue because black Americans were not citizens. And so this was a, essentially a, a, an affirmation of the idea that there has to be a fundamental separation uh, of blacks and whites because blacks are not truly citizens. Then we, we think, then we, and this Dred Scott was one of many, many uh, decisions, and this was in the court, but of course, uh, things that were done in the federal government that eventually led to the Civil War, debates about uh, uh, extending slavery to the, to the territories and so on. But then we get the Civil War amendments uh, in 1865, 1868, and 1870, which at least on their face are pressing for more racial inclusion, uh, undoing, if you like, the Dred Scott decision that, that they outlawed slavery, they created equal protection, uh, forbid it being denied on the basis of race, and the 15th Amendment granted uh, voting rights. Uh, it, it, it said that voting rights could not be withheld on the basis of race or previous condition of servitude. So there you see uh, an attempt to get uh, more inclusive. Uh, polity that then uh, runs into the reality that uh, citizens in the South uh, had, uh, white citizens in the South, had many had not accepted the, the outcome of the Civil War as legitimate, and uh, huge backlash and attempts to undo uh, the effects of the Civil War amendments, and the, we saw, I talked in an earlier lecture, that the Supreme Court was to some extent complicit in that by reading the amendments very narrowly um, so as to uh, limit their effect. And so we had the rise of Jim Crow, uh, first hard apartheid and then soft apartheid. 1896, the court upheld the idea of separation of the races, again, in the educational context. It's separate but equal uh, was a legitimate uh, way to organize uh, K through 12 education. So we, again, we see this uh, pull back uh, from the idea of an integrated polity. Um, 1935, uh, the Social Security Act is passed. And uh, again, another wonderful book by uh, Ira Katz Nelson called Fear Itself deals with the, the passage of the New Deal. And in particular, uh, the, the reality that the only way in which uh, Roosevelt could get uh, the New Deal through Congress, which was controlled by, um, the big committees were controlled uh, by um, Democrats from the South who were strongly opposed to all forms of racial integration, was to make uh, essentially exceptions that would uh, get them to support it. And in particular, the Social Security Act excluded domestic and agricultural workers, most of whom were African American. Uh, and so uh, that was the, if you like, the quid for the quo. We're talking about quid pro quo uh, these days. That was the quid for the quo, uh, to get enough Southern support uh, to pass the Social Security Act. Again, a deprivation of a, a racial group and the, um, and the uh, continuing, um, if you like, soft apartheid in that case, because a proxy rather than race was used to achieve the exclusion. 
then we get the Warren Court, and we get um, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 and 1955, um, overturning Plessy and saying, no, separation is, is uh, not acceptable. There's no possibility of having uh, equal uh, education uh, that is based on racial separation, that it's again bound to be a form of uh, discrimination and perceived as such and experienced as such by black children. And so uh, the court ordered uh, integration of the schools, uh, which was turned out to be uh, much more difficult to achieve uh, for reasons that we have talked about earlier uh, than people might have anticipated. Um, and so again, you see this, this tussle over what is the ideal, you know, the public ideal of America is this notion of a melting pot, uh, that uh, it's a nation of immigrants, people come from all places, and, and uh, Italians and Irish and others uh, have all eventually become part of the melting pot, but uh, with African Americans it seems to be fundamentally different because of this battle over inclusion. Um, and of course, we shouldn't think that this is only a battle among white voters. Uh, and uh, uh, um, we, you know, a lot of the conversation uh, about inclusion versus exclusion uh, tends to treat uh, African Americans as incapable of views and agency of their own uh, on these matters which of course is not the case. And um, if you look at the history of the civil rights movement, um, Martin Luther King was very much for uh, holding up America to its own ideology and saying, you're not living up to the ideals which you profess. This is what Michael Walzer calls eminent criticism in his little book, um, Interpretation and Social Criticism. You take the, the, uh, I, the melting pot ideal and the uh, immigrant story and you say uh, it's, not, it's, it's being violated with respect to African Americans, you're being hypocritical, we need to have uh, the, the kind of inclusion, the American dream should be equally available to all. Um, but not everybody in the uh, African American community agreed, and a rift opened up. A young, um, a young activist by the name of Malcolm X uh, took a very different view of the matter. So let's listen to Malcolm X for a, a minute or two. What is your attitude on the relations between the black and white races? What do you seek to accomplish? The best way to solve the problem that uh, black people are involved in in this country is for, to let us separate from whites and uh, solve our own problems. Do for ourselves that which whites do for themselves. Stop begging the white man and stand on our own feet and solve our own problems. Is it fair to say as a generality and as a, a succinct way to put it that you believe in segregation of the races? The segregation is that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors. Separation is done voluntarily by two equals. You never refer to the Oriental community in which Orientals live exclusively as a segregated community because they live there voluntarily. They, uh, everything there is controlled by them. The economy, the politics, the civic organizations, but the Negro community is referred to as a segregated community because Negroes are forced to live in that community uh, contrary to their will and they don't control the businesses of their community. They don't control the politics of their community nor their social life. We do believe in separation standing on our own feet, among our, among our own kind, and solving our own problems. And that's the only way you'll get a solution to the vital race problem in this country. Our people should unite among ourselves and try and solve our own problems instead of trying to force ourselves upon whites and blame them for our plight. Uh, could we press for a very simple answer to one question? Do you hate all white people? I don't think it's a fair question. White man doesn't even come into my attitude. Uh, he, Mr. Muhammad teaches us to love our own kind and let the white man take care of himself. For a white man today, sir, after uh, kidnapping millions of black people from Africa, 
stripping them of all human characteristics and relegating them to the role of chattel or cattle or animals, commodity, merchandise that could be bought and sold at will. Uh, and then a hundred years since the Emancipation Pro Proclamation, using every type of deceptive method to further us into slavery uh, called second-class citizenship, I think that it would take a whole lot of nerve for white people today to ask Negroes do they hate them. All of the injustices that black people are crying out against in this country are being inflicted upon them by whites. It is the whites who are depriving our people of civil rights. It is, the, it is whites who are depriving our people of uh, implementing what the Supreme Court uh, decision said should be implemented. Uh, wherever black people turn, uh, they are facing the hostility of whites. Martin Luther King teaches Negroes to love all white people, no matter what they do to you, and the same whites whom he teaches Negroes to love sick dogs on him, uh, sick dogs on their children, dogs on their women, and dogs on their babies. So I think it's very hypocritical on the part of whites to accuse Mr. Muhammad of a hate teacher because he says separation and then sick dogs on Martin Luther King who is teaching integration. It means that no matter what the Negro does, he is not going to get along with whites. So I think that Mr. Muhammad's whole philosophy is more intelligent than Mr. King's. So that was the, this, the he was a representative of the black nationalist uh, idea that uh, trying to get integration into uh, the dominant culture was a fool's errand. It hadn't worked in a hundred years and it wasn't going to work uh, anytime soon. And so uh, there should be this separatist agenda that uh, he, he had gotten behind. Uh, it's important to say uh, that he subsequently changed his mind. He had a falling out with Elijah Muhammad, who he talks about there, and he spent some time traveling uh, in, in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere uh, and saw that there were Muslims um, who of many different colors who actually did uh, get along uh, and work together. And he, he lay in, in the following year, he, he actually separated from the nation of Islam and began to support the civil rights agenda, although he, became, he remained a black nationalist. And his... his um, his falling out with, with the Nation of Islam was so, so grave that, if, that they actually they assassinated him, as I'm sure some of you know. Uh, the following year, he was murdered. Um, but in his, in, interestingly, uh, there's a curious kind of historical convergence because uh, uh, Ma Malcolm X uh, became more in favor of integration and the civil rights agenda, whereas actually Mar Martin Luther King uh, in the last years of his life and uh, would become uh, less uh, sanguine about the possibilities of integration. And uh, by the time he was assassinated um, four years later, um, he, he said, well, he, he had not given up hope. He was no longer optimistic, having seen uh, how little had been achieved uh, by that time. Um, so, uh, but there you have it. You have this rift in, in the uh, African-American community uh, over integration and separation, which would th subsequently become transformed into debates about multiculturalism versus um, the integration American dream. Should we try and get everybody uh, to approximate to some national norm um, or should we respect the differences uh, among different groups? And this would become a, uh, a central motif in battles about conflicting narratives going forward. So if we, if we then think about the, you know, the two great achievements of the 1960s from the point of view of race and perhaps the two greatest achievements, including uh, the decades since then, were the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And these were, these were seen as great achievements for the integrationist view that uh, people were no longer going to be denied not just the formal incidence of citizenship, but the substance of, substantive incidence of citizenship and um, 
uh, that, that this was going to be uh, the path going forward. It should be said that uh, the reason there were, there were two separate pieces of legislation was that in 1964, um, the, the Johnson administration was not in favor of voting rights uh, legislation because they thought it would be potentially too explosive. Um, and battles over uh, voting rights had uh, also beset earlier during the New Deal. Uh, the Roosevelt administration in their battles with uh, Southerners who controlled Congress. But uh, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act was when the first big wave of racial violence exploded in the US. There wasn't uh, racial violence um, before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. It came later, and that that was what eventually uh, prompted the recognition that, and that it was going to be essential to have voting rights legislation. So that's why we had two pieces of legislation. Um, another important landmark, I think, in the evolving narratives um, was the publication of what came to be known as the Moynihan Report, named for Patrick Moynihan, uh, a, a famous senator who um, brought a, a very different set of uh, assumptions and tools to thinking about racial disparities in the United States. This is the, the, the Moynihan Report was called uh, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. And it, it was, I think, a, an early indication of how uh, the views of, of white elites who think of themselves as progressive uh, progressive uh, harbingers of, of change can be perceived very differently by the people about whom they are talking. And what concerned Moynihan was the high levels of um, out of wedlock births in the black community. Um, so you can see, uh, you can see on the slide, the Moynihan report is released in 19. Uh, 65, and at that time, uh, uh, African Americans had about 28% uh, of uh, children were born uh, to mothers who were not married, and the numbers were, uh, and percentages were much lower in, uh, among uh, Hispanics and uh, whites and all other groups. And so this produced another narrative uh, that would become hugely contentious about the social pathologies of the black underclass, so-called, um, and that it was really the disintegration of the family that was at the, at the roots of um, the difficulties being experienced in the black community. And um, again, this was uh, widely uh, trumpeted by some as an important uh, thing that needed to be dealt with, but also widely vilified by, by others as, again, denying the agency of African Americans and using language and terminology of medical, medicalized uh, terminology of pathologies and, and so on. Um, and interestingly, of course, uh, the numbers uh, were hotly disputed at the time, and if you look at how they've evolved subsequently, um, you, can, you can see that um, the, the number of children born out of wedlock uh, in white families today is just as high as the number of children born out of wedlock at, in 1965 when, uh, he was, when uh, Moynihan was writing. And more, moreover, and I think this is the reason we get, again, irreconcilable narratives about this. If you ask the question, how many, uh, you know, where are the out of wedlock children born? Uh, of course, because the white community is much larger uh, than the African American community, uh, two thirds of out of wedlock children then and now are actually born in white, uh, to white parents. And so you can find, if you like, if you want to find facts to support a different narrative, there are plenty of conflicting stories that can 
be told. Uh, and, uh, you know, another piece of this is that people would point out that when, uh, when upper middle class white people decide not to have, uh, not to get married, it's seen as a choice of lifestyle, but when a poor black person does it, it's seen as a social pathology. And so, again, you, you, can, you find that these conflicting moral narratives um, are irreconcilable. People glom on to different facts uh, and use them as the decisive ones to illustrate what it is that they are talking about. Um, so so uh, I think that the, the Moynihan report uh, foregrounded a lot of these, these debates about African Americans in ways that made people increasingly speak past one another. Um, Nixon's Southern Strategy in 1968, we've talked about this in an earlier lecture. Um, this is the, the backlash against the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. He takes advantage of that by recognizing that there's a second dimension, when we talked about the Downsian models, that there's a second dimension in that um, resistance to racial integration matters more to many Southern whites than uh, economic benefits from uh, the welfare state. And so uh, it's possible to, uh, if you like, uh, s divide Southern whites by appealing to race. And uh, that, that was the Nixon's Southern strategy. And again, I think brought racial divisions back into the foreground of American politics. And then the next really important step, uh, I think, comes in 1971. And so this is the McGovern-Fraser report on the structure of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party had been in a major crisis in the late 1960s, um, not only because of the assassinations of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, um, who, these, who had both been strong supporters of civil rights, but the, the 1968 uh, election had been uh, explosive for the Democratic Party. But what had happened was, notwithstanding Lyndon Johnson's massive victory in 1964, uh, in huge landslide, he's fortunate to be running against Barry Goldwater at that time, uh, and uh, Goldwater was sufficiently far from the mainstream of American politics, that Johnson um, uh, could prevail. And uh, so, and he had, and then he had used those majorities to enact this civil rights legislation uh, that I've already talked about. But he also, of course, massively escalated the increasingly unpopular war in Vietnam. And by the time 1968 rolled around, it was clear that uh, Johnson couldn't run for re-election. He wasn't going to win. Um, but this was at a time when the uh, parties were governed much more top-down. I will talk more about that on Thursday. Uh, and there was a, there was a, a sense that um, that uh, the anti-war sentiment in the Democratic Party uh, had to be contained. Uh, but the, the trouble was, once Johnson was not running, uh, all of the candidates who were, were running were anti-war candidates. So Vice President Hubert Humphrey uh, was sort of parachuted into the race. He didn't run in any primaries. He was named as the candidate. And this produced an explosion at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, that, and there was viol violence in the streets, um, and there was a, a strong sense of crisis in the Democratic Party. And this produced a movement for reform. Uh, no more smoke-filled rooms. We are going to democratize the Democratic Party. And so um, a political scientist, a very distinguished political scientist, by the name of Austin Ranney, chaired this commission with um, some others that became known as the McGovern-Fraser Commission. And it recommended, uh, among other things, much greater use of primaries, and, and I'll talk more about that on Thursday, but also 
democratization of the power structures of the Democratic Party, and in particular, the, the use of quotas uh, for various minority, for women and various minority groups in uh, the, the decisions about um, platform committees, the governance of the party, um, the selection of delegates, um, much more what we've since come to call descriptive representation, much uh, a kind of uh, that different groups must all be represented in the governance of the Democratic Party. And that indeed is what transpired. Um, and this is part and parcel of, of the acceleration in attention to uh, racial and ethnic characteristics in thinking about the distribution of, of offices and other benefits. Uh, that same decade, in 1978, the uh, Supreme Court finally took up the question of affirmative action in this uh, Bakke uh, decision in uh, University of California Davis Medical School, which had set aside some positions for minority candidates. Um, and uh, Bakke was somebody who scored less well, uh, I'm sorry, scored better uh, on the test than the minority candidates who were admitted in the uh, set-aside places, and he sued, and he prevailed. Uh, in, but what was interesting uh, in, in the decision was that uh, the court said you can't have quotas uh, for minorities, but you can take race into account. And this then became the, the moment in, at which uh, the hugely fraught subsequent history of battles about affirmative action got started, and particularly whether words like diversity, we, we're now going through this uh, in, in all the elite universities of the, the uh, government looking at whether diversity is being used as a smokescreen for ethnic and racial quotas. Uh, you, it, you can have diversity, you can take race into account, among other characteristics, but you can't have quotas. And so uh, this whole debate about affirmative action uh, has become another one of these conflicting um, uh, moral narratives. In 1984, um, at the Democratic, uh, in the Democratic race, we're now in the middle of the Reagan administration and the Democrats are running uh, in, uh, basically, uh, Walter Mondale is gonna likely be the candidate and uh, Jesse Jackson, a young uh, civil rights leader at that time, is mounted a campaign against him, uh, did surprisingly well in a number of primaries, um, but in the end had to support the ticket, and he makes a speech at the Democratic National Convention in 1984 where he tries to put together these very disparate ideas of uh, melting pot versus multiculturalism, and he uses the metaphor of a rainbow coalition. So he's trying to square the circle, if you like, and, and this is how he goes about it. Our flag is red, white, and blue, but our nation is rainbow. Red, yellow, brown, black, and white. We're all precious in God's sight. America, America is not like a blanket, one piece of unbroken cloth, the same color, the same texture, the same size. America is more like a quilt, many patches, many pieces, many colors, many sizes, all woven and held together by a common thread. The white, the Hispanic, the black, the Arab, the Jew, the woman, the Native American, the small farmer, the business person, the environmentalist, the peace activist, the young, the old, the lesbian, the gay, and the disabled make up the American quilt. <laughs> 
even in our fractured state, all of us count and fit somewhere. We are proven that we can survive without each other, but we are not proven that we can win and make progress without each other. We must come together. So there, there you have the idea of a rainbow coalition. And it's, it's interesting that when you actually go back and find the speech, it's very clear that he intends everyone to be included. But again, this is an area where I think you get divergent narratives because the, the, in the, in the uh, commentary on uh, the history of uh, identity politics and racial identity politics in, in the US, uh, the, this is interpreted as the moment at which the, uh, the Democratic Party starts to think of itself as a patchwork of minorities. He talks about the patchwork uh, metaphor there, but a, a patchwork of minorities, a strong deference to multiculturalism, uh, all, the different, you know, all the different minorities should uh, form an alliance uh, to change the status quo. Whereas in the actual speech, he's very clear that uh, you know, he's also referring to whites. But that's not how it came to be interpreted in the dominant lexicon. And indeed, you can hear people say, well, the thing about a rainbow, it contains every color except white. Uh, and so the, the notion that uh, this patchwork of minorities, uh, if, if that becomes the dominant ethos of the Democratic Party, there's going to be no place in it uh, for the sort of people that Arlie Hochschild is talking about when she's talking about uh, cutting in. Um, so uh, that, there we have the, the idea of the Rainbow Coalition. And it's important to say that while the, the idea of uh, descriptive representation in politics starts in the Democratic Party, uh, with the McGovern-Fraser reforms, it also migrates into the political system more broadly with the advent of majority-minority districts and the fight over majority-minority districts. And so this was, this was the idea that uh, was, was developed in order to try and get African Americans elected to Congress, particularly from the South, where uh, it seemed almost impossible uh, to do that. And this is partly because of the way districting is done in the United States. It's done uh, by whoever, uh, at least at this time, it's now a more complicated story, but at this time, the districts were always drawn by whoever controlled the state legislature after the decennial census. So you'd have a new census, and then it's still the case in most uh, in two-thirds of the states. The, some, some states now have independent commissions to do it, but basically uh, most states still, still have this system. And, and what was done was the districts were drawn so as to dilute African-American representation. And when the um, Voting Rights Act was reauthorized in 1982, um, uh, stronger uh, requirements were put in uh, that essentially said that the uh, Section 2 of the, of the Voting Rights Act required the drawing of districts in certain circumstances that would lead to uh, the possibility of electing African Americans. And it was, you might think, somewhat surprising that legislation reauthorized in 1982 would do this because this is during the Reagan administration, uh, which was, would one would not have thought would be particularly friendly to this idea. But although the, uh, the White House was not in favor of this uh, legislation, in fact, a number of Republicans on the Hill and, a Republican, and Republican strategists were in favor of it because they saw it as a possibility of actually uh, reducing um, democratic strength in the South. So the, the thought would be, well, if you create a majority-minority district, you might increase the number of African Americans in Congress at the expense of reducing 
the number of Democrats in Congress. And so some people have spoken about an unholy alliance between the Congressional Black Caucus and, and Congressional uh, Republicans, and at some points even uh, the, the uh, Justice Department, to support this idea, or at least not to oppose it uh, very strongly, so as to, uh, as I said, people with very different motives. The Congressional Black Caucus wanted to increase its size, but Republicans who supported this idea saw it as a way of strengthening themselves in the House. In any case, in, in 1986, the Supreme Court took up this matter and said that it's okay to have um, majority-minority districts provided um, the, the minority group is large and compact enough to con constitute a single um, district and provided uh, the group is politically cohesive and can demonstrate that and uh, provided the minority group can show that it, it votes sufficiently as a group to defeat the minority group's uh, preferred candidate. So the idea was if, if you can show that you're uh, voting together as a group and you conceive yourself as a group, um, they can draw uh, districts to increase uh, minorities. And so as, as of 2015, I believe there were 122 majority minority districts in the United States, which is roughly a quarter of the districts in the House. Uh, so again, uh, you have um, appeal to the idea of separation in, in, in drawing districts, uh, creating um, districts which will send um, minority candidates to Congress, which they indeed did. The number of minority candidates in Congress increased as a result of this, and it should be said that, that in state legislatures, uh, the same thing was done. Uh, again, uh, this was as a, a response to previous forms of districting that had, um, that had excluded African Americans uh, from the possibility of electing uh, African Americans to office. Um, 2009, uh, uh, Risi versus DiStefano, uh, the reason I bring this case up is I think, again, it really speaks to the conflicting, irreconcilably conflicting narratives uh, that have beset uh, these debates about inclusion and exclusion. So this was a, this was a Connecticut case, Mayor John DeStefano, Mayor of New Haven. Uh, these, this was a firefighters uh, union case. And what had happened is that... Um, uh, the, the city of New Haven had given an, an exam for promotion to, uh, of, to officer, and um, uh, no African Americans had done well enough on the exam to be promoted, and so the city, fearing litigation uh, from African Americans about a discriminatory uh, test, at least a test that had a discriminatory impact, disregarded, uh, disregarded the results of the test uh, and didn't use it. Uh, this then produced a lawsuit. There was one, one Hispanic uh, and 19 white plaintiffs, and the, the court upheld uh, their objection. And so uh, uh, the, the decision um, to, to get rid of the test was uh, held, held to violate the rights of um, Risi and his colleagues. So the reason I bring this up in this context is not about the result, because, but rather it really underlines one of the realities about affirmative action, which is um, that we tend to think about affirmative action very differently from the way many people experience it on the ground. This was summed up in 1995 in a book by a man called uh, Michael Lind, The Next American Nation, um, The New Nationalism and the Next, it's The New na Nationalism and the Next American, or the Fourth American Revolution. And he had a, he had a, he, a discussion of what he called a white overclass. Again, this is the kind of liberal elites uh, 
that uh, would turn out to be objects of rage and ire from those uh, voters that Arlie Hochschild was going to be interviewing later. But he, 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 uh, Lynn made the, made the observation, he said, the white overclass, and he was thinking here of sort of people we might today characterize as limousine liberals, can uh, live right and think left. That, that, um, and so the thought here was that affirmative action has no real effect on the kind of people who live in Scarsdale. Um, they can get advantages for their sons and daughters. We are seeing one of the scandals about how they do it uh, in college admissions uh, playing out right now. Lind was saying this in 1995, very interesting book. Um, and that, uh, but the real front line, the real battles over effect, uh, affirmative action are exactly in places like promotions in the police department and the fire department. And that's where uh, people on the short end of affirmative action say, I never had slaves, I never did anything to discriminate against African Americans, why am I not getting that promotion? So this is, if you like, Lend is in 1995 a already identifying the beginning of this cutting in narrative uh, that feeds the sense of grievance um, that uh, drives the, the uh, anger and resentment that Hochschild and Kramer have documented. And just to bring us right up to date, if you, if you look at the, current, at the Democratic primaries, uh, you know, among the things which uh, they are talking about and fighting about are uh, questions about reparations. Again, reparations is uh, uh, an idea which, which produces very divergent narratives. Some people see them as absolutely morally compelling. Uh, others see them, uh, including uh, African-American uh, left-wing intellectuals such as Adolph Reed Jr. sees debates about uh, reparations as uh, hugely destructive of uh, the possibility of building the sort of alliances that uh, could produce progressive change. And so, um, the, so the, again, you're back in this world of irreducibly conflicting narratives that are important to people in understanding themselves and their identities uh, and, mo and that motivate them in politics, even to the point where perhaps uh, they'll take positions that are self-defeating from, uh, from a materialist point of view uh, or from an interest-based point of view. And that really is... Uh, I think the takeaway when we, when we delve into this history and we see the ways in which race has played out in American politics, uh, it it's constantly feeds these mutually incompatible narratives. And this is, a, this is a, an important thing to know because it's one of the ways in which modernization theory got uh, politics very badly wrong. To, to this point in this course, I've talked about modernization theory and democracy, uh, that there were these predictions that countries would become more democratic over as they developed economically. But there was another important prediction of modernization theory, uh, which in some ways underlay, underlay the prediction about democracy, and that was the prediction that identity politics was, would over time be displaced by interest-based politics. That things like uh, religion and race and so on would atrophy uh, as uh, sources of political mobilization. And, and this, this is something about which um, they couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, and it, it's you know, partly the prediction that democracy would arise is that when you think about uh, divisible goods, which uh, is important for the divided dollar game and for democracy to work, that is things like money and income. Um, once you start talking about identity politics, it's not about divisible goods, it's about a very different kind of politics. It's about recognition, it's about status, it's about um, 
telling moral narratives that either uh, validate you or humiliate you. And so we have um, reached a world in which we have these, these conflicting narratives that are not easily reconciled, even when they're about the same topic, such as affirmative action or majority-minority districts uh, or uh, um, racial set-asides uh, of other sorts. You get these mutually incompatible narratives. And what happened after 2016 is that one of these became weaponized, um, essentially. Trump found a way to weaponize the, the, um, the narrative of cutting in uh, that, that uh, hoax shield uh, had uncovered. And that is the story of the, the, the socioeconomic uh, sources of populism as it's played out, and we'll turn to the political sources of it on Thursday.